you know the Bible says to give elders who rule and the word and um, who labor in the word and rule over our lives. The Bible tells us to even give them a double honor. And we know that that is what God's word has to say about these certain positions. But I believe this evening that there are other parts of the body of Christ that also deserve honor. You see, what we're conditioned to is the high-level calling, and we're conditioned to, you know, bring in praise and glory and honor to the pastors, the apostles, the evangelists. But I really want to put a highlight on the average, regular, day-to-day -to -day Christian tonight. And I want to really point out a scripture that commands us to Bring honor to these people. And that is what we're going to read in our text. You see, we understand that these fine men, that they would labor to lead us according to God's will. But there is a critical part of the body of Christ. And it's every individual can be involved in this. And they can play a role. And, you know, in our fellowship, you know, the way usually this, this word, this term that I'm going to be preaching on tonight is if you go to a young man and you ask him, hey, are you called to preach the gospel? If he's not called to preach, he will oftentimes respond by saying, no, I'm called to be a pillar. No, I'm not going to be preaching. I'm not going to be leaving uh, to replicate my mother church. I'm going to be uh, a pillar. I'm going to be staying back. And I believe this evening that pillars deserve honor. I believe this evening that the average Christian, that the regular Christian, not just bringing glory and honor uh, and elevating those who are called, but I believe this evening uh, that those who are called to stay and serve and love and support deserve honor. You're like, Pastor, that's your sermon tonight? Really? Yeah, really. Pillars deserve honor. So let's read. I want to preach on being a pillar, 1 Corinthians 12, 19 to 24. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. The head to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. The parts that we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. Wow, the more honorable parts do not require the special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor, anybody say extra honor, and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. Are you, hear, are you hearing that tonight? God has placed the body so that the members, the parts of the body, that listen, they might have less dignity, at least to the public eye, at least to society, at least to the church world. But the scripture is telling us that God wants us to put extra honor. And I'm speaking to you about the regular individual. I'm speaking to you about just the regular Christian in the local church. That this individual, the man, the woman that says they're going to serve, that they deserve an honor. That it's, listen, it's not just something small to say I'm going to support, I'm going to stay behind, and I'm going to love, and I'm going to be an example. That they deserve an extra honor. In our text, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And he's speaking about the body of Christ. He's using body parts as an analogy to describe how every individual is a member of the body. Verse 18, our bodies have many parts and God has put each part where he wants it. But I want to draw your attention tonight of verse 23. And I want to draw your attention out of the New King James translation. Because then you'll understand what I'm really trying to communicate to you tonight. The Bible says those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our, unpre 
unpresentable parts have greater modesty. In other words, the obvious, the, the average Christian, listen, it's so easy for us to speak highly of the missionary that has gone and built 20 churches. But I'm here to declare to you that we need to bring a special honor to the average Christian. To the person that stays behind, to the person that maybe society is not looking at, you know, looking at them and looking at their lives, you know, like they're Billy Graham, like they've done great things, but they've been faithful. How many know faithfulness deserves honor? They've been committed. How many know commitment deserves honor? They've been faithful. They've been here through the years and they would serve and they would come service at the service, fulfilling their ministries, uh, loving people. Uh, I'm here to declare to you, uh, you might think that this is, uh, this is unusual, this is boring, but I'm here to tell you that pillars deserve honor. I'm here to declare to you that pillars, Paul says on these, the people that everyone looks at uh, down and they just say, oh, look at that person, that old man. Uh, he barely does anything, but he's here and he's faithful, isn't he? That these people deserve an honor. A pillar tonight can be defined as an active church member who is heavily involved in the endeavors of his or her local church. Pillars are servants. You're not a pillar if you're not willing huh, to, to, to clean, if you're not willing to serve, if you're not willing to be in ministry, you're not a pillar. And so I'm not speaking, I'm, not, I'm in no shape or form here tonight uh, trying to uh, empower anyone uh, to be lazy or to not have a servant's heart. Uh, I'm speaking to you about pillars. And if you're going to be a pillar, huh, you're going to be a servant. That pillars are servants. They are consistent in their service. That they have a heart to serve people. That they care about the service of people. That they put others before self. That is what pillars do. They put other people uh, before themselves tonight. Uh, listen, listen, some want to leave their mother church, uh, and that's a great thing to do uh, and answer the call of God. And I'm going to touch more on that. Uh, but listen, we need to bestow greater honor because there are guys, man. There are guys, and it's, they just want to get sent out because of the power of it. They have a power tri chip or a trip, or rather, they have a chip on their shoulder. They want to prove themselves. Uh, they don't really love people. They're not really called by God, uh, but it's the cool thing to do to get sent out one day. And because in their minds, in their, you know, in their hearts, they think uh, that they're going to gain greater honor uh, by going out on the field someday. But you can be honorable in your mother church. You can be honorable uh, as a servant. Can you say Amen. You can be honorable here as you serve, as you love people and you love God. A pillar is someone that's found their place. You know, you look at buildings, pillars are stationary. Are you with me tonight? They found their place. They know exactly how their life is going. They know how they're serving. They know which areas of impact they're making in their local church. This is where I serve. This is what I do. I impact in this manner. They found their place. And they stay there. And they're stationary. And that is what a pillar is. And pillars deserve honor tonight. I want to tell you something. The devil attacks pillars. You know, it's clear the enemy being a snake, being the way he is. Yeah, we can easily come to the conclusion. And there's tons of scriptural references that he attacks the head first. If the devil is going to attack a church, he wants to attack the pastor. He wants to attack the pastor's wife. And we get that. But I believe there are times when the devil would just play a trick and go around that and say, you know what? I'm going to attack the leaders. I'm going to attack the pillars because I know if I can tear down the pillars, the whole thing is going to tremble. It's going to tremble. Everything is just going to come down because I have attacked what is upholding everything else. And I, I believe the enemy attacks pillars, uh, that the enemy comes uh, and he creates confusion and he creates division among the members of the church and he wants to attack pillars. Ephesians 2, 19 to 21 so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Built 
on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And so the Bible is talking about the church, verse 19, uh, members of the household of God. And the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Uh, while Jesus is at the cornerstone, he's at the center of this all. But I want to tell you, you have the apostles, you have the, uh, you have the prophets, you have Jesus in the center. Uh, but I want to tell you, it is the average Christian. Uh, it is your everyday father fine working men and women uh, that are pillars to the church of God to every local church uh, yes there are those that we easily bring honor to uh, but there are pillars there are those uh, who might seem insignificant um, and I want to tell you those people matter I want to tell you the pillars matter and the enemy uh, the devil if I was the devil I would attack pillars because I understand how things are structured in a local church. The pillars are doing everything. I understand the pillars are what's keeping this thing alive and keeping this thing sustained. I would attack pillars. I say this all the time at men's discipleship classes. That the quality of our church will be determined by the quality of our men. And I can edit that statement and say that the quality of our church can be determined by the quality of our pillars. In other words, those who stay behind, those who are the servants in the local church, man, the average Christian. He's not the flashy guy. He's not, not the flashy sister that everyone looks at and says, she's going to be a pastor's wife. She's going to win a thousand souls. No, the average person, the average person matters. And how they live their lives affects the quality of our church. Think about this. Pillars, Satan attacking pillars. Judges, interesting story in the book of Judges. 16, 29 to 30. The Bible says, then Samson reached towards the two central pillars on which the temple stood. And so the temple is being held up by two central pillars. And then the Bible says, bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. He's screaming this out to God. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he was alive. And so think about how many Philistines uh, Samson had killed in his lifetime. Here he is, one last fight. Right? It's, it's like, uh, uh, what's, the, what's the black boxer's name again? The, uh, the guy that's never lost a fight. Floyd Mayweather. Right? His last fight. Every time he comes around, there's a last fight. It's a big deal because he's never lost. And so here's Samson at the end of his life. And, and, and so here he is. The Philistines are in this temple with him. And here he is. And he's, he, he's having this conversation with God. And he's like, okay, yeah, I cut my hair. But please, one more time. And he grabs these pillars, man. He grabs these pillars and he pushes them. He pulls them. He pushes them. And then all the, the whole temple collapses. And all the Philistines die with him. Thousands of Philistines die with him. Now, we know this story is for the glory of God because the Philistines are obviously a representation of some a pe a people who are against the people of God. And there's always a, a conflict with them and the children of Israel. But if you flip that, the enemy does the exact same thing. The enemy, like Samson, understands that if I can tear down the pillars, I can tear down the people of God. The enemy understands that if I can break down the pillars, the entire temple will come down. If I can get into people's minds and confuse them about the vision of the church, the temple will come down. If I can get into people's attitudes and now all of a sudden uh, they no longer have the same convictions that they had uh, when they were new converts, uh, the enemy understands the temple will come down. Are you hearing me tonight, friends? 
The enemy understands if he can get into the average Christian that he's going to affect the entire quality of the church. That it's not just about the pastor. It's not just about the higher ups. It's not just about the Bible study leaders. But it's the average Christian and our attitude. And the enemy knows that, listen, it is the pillars. If I can push the pillars out, if I can confuse them, if I can bring some confusion in their lives, that I can have victory in this church. I can stop all that God is doing simply through the pillars. If I can get through the pillars, I can stop all that God is doing. And that's what the enemy does in people's lives. That's what the enemy does in people's hearts. And so this term, we use it so loosely. And we try to think, okay, you know, we understand. Like, we, we close our eyes. And even in this picture, Tracy's showing me their different pictures. He's wondering which one to use and stuff like that. She had a Catholic one up there. Um, and so, and, and so, and, and so we, when we close our eyes, we, we understand what pillars look like. But nowadays, buildings have pillars, but we don't see them. They're covered by drywall. So what is a pillar in a local church? Because I've made some references, but what, but what does that look like in your life? What do pillars do? What does a pillar look like? Are you a pillar? Are you someone that can say you're upholding this thing? Are you, is, is there traits of a pillar in your life? I want to tell you, man, if you're called to preach before, you're, before you leave, you're a pillar. You know, the, the, the people have this mindset, man. It's like, it's like okay, I'm called. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach one day, so I, uh, I'm going to just do my own thing or whatever. No, listen, you have to be a pillar. You have to be able to support. So I want to make very clear, first things first, pillars uphold. A pillar upholds, they uphold weight. So if you run, you're, if you're constantly running from the pressures of ministries, you're not a pillar. If, it's, if, if life is always so troublesome, the troubles of life are always conflicting with the, with the weight of ministries, and you're always constantly running, and it's always a, a, a tussle. It's like, okay, well, life is getting hard at this season, so let me do less for my church. If that's your approach to life, then you can't be a pillar. Imagine these pillars holding this building or this temple. Imagine if one of these pillars just decided, well, it's rainy now, so let me just do less. <laughs> what, what would happen to this building? Imagine if the pillars in your house did that. Well, there's a, there's a, there's a snowstorm outside. I'm a little bit cold. I'm just going to crumble. I'm just going to crumble. What would happen in your house? What happens is the pillars around you now have more weight to, to carry, right? This, this is just basic math or science or vision. <laughs> the pillars around you now have a lot more to carry, a lot more to do. But the job of a pillar, a pillar upholds. So I want to close and talk up to you about three things that pillars uphold. The first is pillars uphold doctrine. It is pillars in the church of God that clear up confusion. And they uphold doctrine of what the congregation believes. You know what I love about doctrine in the church? It's that we're not just a, a, a random group of people that get together. And the only thing that we believe is that Jesus was born of a virgin. That, that, that's, that's crazy. No, but th there is a symmetry, there is a consistency, there is a pattern among us. As a congregation, we believe the same things. And Paul made this very clear. I want you to be of the same mind. I want you to be of the same mind. I want you to speak the same things. If we cannot be united in doctrine, we can't be united at all. And pillars, it's the job of the average Christian, uh, the average individual in ministry. Uh, it, is, it is their job because I'm going to tell you, uh, you're going to be in a lot of scenarios where the pastor's not around. You're going to be in a lot of scenarios where a leader that is vocal is not around. Because there's sometimes leaders, they're around, crazy things happen, and they're just, they're still shy, they're still intimidated. They don't speak up, they don't correct. But you're going to be in situations where there's not a leader around to correct and to correct doctrine. Listen, you're going to have to be that pillar to say, no, 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 we don't believe that. The word of God is true and it has no error. Jesus is fully God and fully man. 
He's not 50% God and 50% man. Can you say amen? And so you're going to have to, you're going to have to know your Bible. You're going to have to know some doctrine. If you're going to have, if you're going to be a pillar, if you're going to be someone who upholds, you're going to have to know your doctrine. We believe as a church in a rapture. We believe in the pre-tribulation rapture. We believe that men and women are equal in value, but have different roles in the home and different roles in the church of God. We believe that leadership is male. And these are the things that keep us intact. We believe these things. We believe in the, in the word of God, the authority of scriptures, that if the Bible says something and we have a different opinion, then we shut up. Because the Bible has the final authority, friends. And it's what the Bible says overall. And we believe that. We're not going to debate the Bible. And so it is the pillar's responsibility uh, to study God's word, to invest and buy a study Bible. They're $56. Go buy one. Order one on Amazon. Know what your word says, friends. Because you're not always going to have Brother Daniel there to correct you. You're not. You're not always going to have someone there to say, no, you know what, what you just said, that's wrong. That's incorrect. That, that's not good preaching. That's, that, that's, that's not good doctrine. That's not what the Bible teaches. You're not always going to have pastor there. But you might be in an environment, in a situation, at a fellowship, at a restaurant, and new converts are there. Here you are. You, you hold your ministry. Uh, you know you've been in church for six months, a year, whatever. You're going to have to speak up because pillars uphold doctrine. You're going to have to uphold doctrine in order to keep the consistency of what we believe. The Bible is infallible in all of its teachings without error. How many of you believe that? There are people in churches, oh, yeah, it's 87% true. So the, the other percentage that you don't believe, how do you know? How do you know, how do you know it's not the 87 that's not true. How do you, if, you're, if we're going to question some, you might as well question all. Is it God's word or is it not God's word? And so we need, to, we need to understand that. We need to have a consistency in what we believe. That Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. Oh, I'm preaching good tonight. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. You have heard me teach these things. That have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now, teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them down to others. And so Paul here is speaking to Timothy and he's talking about a pattern, a, a passing down of, ministry, of doctrine. A, a pattern to pass down doctrine. You've heard me teach doctrine. You've heard me in bring instruction. Put that verse back up there. People are still taking notes. Uh, you've heard me bring instruction. You've heard me teach doctrine. Uh, and so listen, what you heard from me, uh, you need to pass it down to other trustworthy people. And this creates a consistency. It creates a pattern in our church for doctrine. Number two, pillars uphold culture. So pillars uphold doctrine, but pillars uphold culture. Okay, I want you to listen to me, and I want you to listen to me good. Pillars keep cultures intact. They keep culture alive. Culture simply means way of life. That's all culture means. In our church, we have a variety of things that we do that's just, it's just our culture. It's just who we are. It's LHC. It's bring that back or run that back. It's just who we are. And so one of the things we have is a culture of hospitality. We love people. We open our homes to people. We love to fellowship because we love one another. And so we have a culture of hospitality. Any given individual that lives in this proximity uh, has opened their homes to other people and said, come, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to love you. I'm going to, sh I'm going to open you up to my home, which is a sign uh, of opening you up to me. And this is one of the reasons, if you study or read up on church history, one of the reasons the church in Jerusalem blew up and grew so fast is because of hospitality. And hospitality is an amazing church building tool. When you can open up your home to people and they can see, wow, these Christians are different. Uh, these people, there's something about them. Uh, why would you, Brother Nemi, testifies to this day, his first service. 
He came in with this mindset, I'm going to test these guys out, just test the water out, you know, just see what's going on. And he was so shocked. His first service, he was at my house. And he's like, these people don't know me. I could be robbing them. I could be doing this. I could be doing that. But that spoke volumes to him. And hospitality is a culture that we have, but as a pillar, as you, as you, as you embrace yourself to say, I'm gonna, I want to join ministry, I want to grow, I want to do more for the church, you're going to have to uphold that. You're going to have to be willing that even if you get a little shack, man, even if it's half the size of the stage, you're going to have to open up your home. Now, don't have a fellowship with 20 people now. But you understand what I'm saying. Take someone out. Buy them a coffee or a tea, Air Grey, to be specific. <laughs> you know, how, you know it, it open someone up to your life outside of just church. And so pillars uphold a culture of hospitality. In our church, we have a culture of prayer. We pray before each service because we believe that other than hearing the word from God, listen, before we hear a word from God, we got to open our hearts to God. And so we, we pray an hour before every service. This is what we do. We open our church doors from Mondays to Fridays, 7 to 9 a.m. Because we believe in prayer. It is a culture. Listen, prayer is not something that you do when life gets bad. Prayer should be a culture. It should be a way of life. It's something we're constantly doing. And if you're going to be a pillar, you're going to have to be an example in the prayer room. This is why I, 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 you know, I, I try to keep my head you know, the hair on my head, black, you know. But when I get up and I go to the cafe and there's like 18 people, it turns gray. You know what I'm saying? It's just a bother. And, you know, I've been like that for years, you know, and I hope I never change. You know, Pastor Mitchell, and I would never do this, just, just so you know, I'm just sharing a story. Pastor Mitchell and, to, and Prescott, he would take the mic during prayer meetings and then he would go on stage and say, shut up and pray. <laughs> you know, that was the 80s. People were more thick-skinned than now, right? And so I would never consider anything like that. But there is a, it, it, it just, my brain explodes, you know? Why is, why is there eight people standing there? Waiting for teas, and there's like there's one guy doing sound, but there's eight guys in the sound room. <laughs> Why? Can't we just sit here and pray? Is that so hard? And so as a pillar, you're gonna have to uphold the culture of prayer. You're following up on someone, huh? they know that your first class is at 10, but you never come the morning prayer. That's not really doing good. They know you start work at 12. They know you're off that day, but you've never invited them to come to morning prayer with you. They're seeing that. New converts are watching your life. They see you walking into the prayer room 20, 30 minutes after, and you're being an example to them. As a pillar, you have to uphold the culture. That is our responsibility as pillars. We have a culture in our church of discipleship. This is a culture. This is not a program. We have people who are involved in this, many people. I'm still a disciple. To this day, I still call my pastor. I still am very close to my pastor. I still ask questions. I'm still learning. I still read books and articles. I still listen to sermons on a daily basis. And so we try to keep this culture. A disciple is a disciplined student, a disciplined learner. We try to create this culture uh, where, you know, if you're here and someone's working with you, I want you to know that they have someone in their lives that they're looking up to. And that is the culture of discipleship in our church. And you keep that as a pillar, but making sure you're always involved in people's lives. When we came here uh, and we started this church in 2018, uh, it was just my family uh, and my wife, my kids, uh, and Precious. Uh, and I remember telling my wife, we went to a Tucson conference, and they asked me to testify. Uh, there was nothing going on. There was really nothing to testify about. Uh, amen. Don't worry, Precious. You're still special to us. But there's not much going on. And so, you know, they asked me to testify. And, and here I am. And I remember saying to the conference buddy, I told my wife, as long as we're working with people, we're doing something good. And this is the culture. Listen, you have to hold, you have to latch on to this. 
You had li- 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 Listen, the fact that you can go a whole week without talking to somebody, without sending someone a verse, without encouraging somebody, without seeing how are you doing spiritually, uh, you're not being a good pillar. Because you have to uphold the culture of discipleship. There's a culture of evangelism. And this is probably the, one of the toughest things to deal with in our generation. Because you have young people who are absolutely deceived that the next chapter in their lives, they will be more available to preach the gospel. And I've never bought into that lie, or it's just this job. Don't worry, I'm going to talk to my boss. When I get another job, I'm going to have more free time. That never happens. That's always a lie. It never happens. Because if you cannot fight to make, listen, this, it's, all about, it's all a priority. It's a priority game. If you cannot fight to evangelize in this season, what makes you think you're going to fight the next season? And so if you're going to say that you're a pillar, pillars uphold culture, friends. The culture of evangelism is, some, when was the last time you took a new convert outreach with you? When was the last time you, you were an example and you brought someone to church? When was the last time you cared? You're on your knees weeping, God, use me. I want to win a soul for Jesus. And so if you're going to be a pillar, you have to uphold culture. Matthew 28, one more and we'll close. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of this age, of the age. Number three, pillars uphold finances. And this is another one that is very, very important for us to understand. That as a pillar, you have to make it a burden of yours to say, I am going to care for the financial strains of my church. Because if you don't, then we're going to have to rely on the monthly income that we get from the government. Government pays us? You wish. (laughs) Lorenda's like, yeah, right. I wish. (laughs) You think the government gives the church money? How do you think we pay for all the evangelistic events? I almost broke down weeping. I, I, I had to text Lorenda. I went to the community center to rent the room. For the, <laughs> for the Halloween play that we're doing. And then I texted the man from the Mississauga Church, the drama team leader, and said, hey, we have the room from 7 to 9. He called me right away. I'm driving. I already left the community center. He called me right away. He said, Jelson. He said, bro, the room's from 7 to 9? He said, bro, every time we do that play, it takes us two and a half hours to set it up in our church. I said, bro, are you serious? <laughs> two and a half hours? Bro, I just spent 250 just to rent it. <laughs> two and a half hours? So I had to go back and drop another 250. Now, it's gonna hurt if no one answers the altar call. <laughs> <laughs> So just think about that. 500 bucks for one outreach event. Now, if you're, if, you're, if you're any involved, sometimes we get guys to go out and buy stuff, man. There's, listen, our outreach budget, we spend a lot of money. Printing flyers is not cheap. We spend a lot of money just to do things, just renting this building and paying for the internet bill. All these different things. We spend a bunch of money on stuff. And there is no government funding. So who pays for that? Pillars. Pillars uphold finances. Pillars uphold finances. Pillars are givers. If you are not a giver, you are not a pillar. If you are not a giver, you are not a pillar. Acts 4, 34 to 35. I'm going to share a story. The piano player can come and play, and I'll just sit there. Um, uh, I'm going to share a story <laughs> uh, of, of something that happened. You know, I called my pastor, and I'm talking, and I'm talking. He didn't really seem interested. But listen to this. 
Oh, there she is. It's not my wife. Okay, cool. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Nonso. My wife usually comes and just watches me. I, I'm expecting her to play, and it's just... <laughs> oh, she's there. I thought she was doing Little Lambs. Acts 4, 34 to 35. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of all the things that were sold and lay them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each as anyone had need. And so the, this is the explosive revival that's happening in the church in Jerusalem. And so this is Pentecost, man, and there's revival and people, things are, everything's on fire. It's Holy Ghost. And there is a culture, there is something that happened among these people. Now, I read this text so many times. But I remember one time I was reading it, and it just dawned on me that this was not an obligation. Do you, do you view that like this as well? Do you think of it like this? Think about this. These people went and they sold everything they had, and they brought the money to the apostles. Why would they do that? And I'm thinking, I'm there. I remember reading this text years ago, and I called Pastor. I said, Pastor, I just had an amazing revelation. And I'm going off, and I'm breaking down. I said, I'm, I'm explaining to him everything I'm reading, and I'm studying. And I realized there's no verse in the Old Testament, there's no verse in the New Testament that ever tells a group of people to go sell all their belongings and go come give it to the church. In other words, they're not doing this out of command. They're not doing this out of obligation. They're doing this out of a culture. That they seen it. They seen it. It could have sparked with one individual, the one radical that starts a wave. And they seen maybe this one individual, this one woman, this one man of God. And they were moved and then it created this culture. And all of them started to do it until you flip the next chapter. And then there's a couple, Ananias and Sapphira. And they go and they sell all that they had, but they wanted to keep some of the proceeds, the Bible says. And so they lied about the amount. Let's just say they had made $100. They said, okay, we're going to put 20 in our pocket to, and tell Peter and the apostles that we only made $80. The minute they lied, God killed them at the altar. And then they went to go pick them up. Your husband is dead, and the disciples are coming to pick up your body too, Peter says. But it began to dawn on me that, listen, this wasn't out of obligation. This wasn't out of command that these people, they had a burden and they did this out of culture. They did this from the heart. I'm going to tell you, when you sell your house and you lay down all, every single penny, that is not a tithe. That is given. That is grace given. That is not out of obligation. But if you think, if your approach to God's church is $5 and $10, you're not a pillar. And I understand people are students. I understand people don't have money. That's fine. But if you work, that's disgusting. Some of the men should say amen. There we go. Healing has to start somehow. I thank God for fine young men who are tuned in with God who will answer the call of God and will say, God, I'm going to study your word. I'm going to learn how to love people. You've called me to preach. I'm going to preach. I thank God for those fine young men. But you know what? I feel bad for uh, when they're in churches, man, uh, and the pillars are not givers. Because then we can't send you out. We need dollars, guys, money. Our first year pioneering, we're up the street from here. Our first year pioneering, we had my family, we had Precious, and Nemi slept every service at the front seat, just like he is today, with his neck bent and his mouth open. Every service. That first year, our mother church spent $24,000 in us. For a skinny Nigerian girl and a guy that's sleeping. $24,000. $24,000. God's going to give us preachers. God's going to give us men who are going to be in tune with him, who are going to be bold, who are going to have natural leading abilities. 
We have that. We're going to have more. We're going to plant churches someday. But it's going to take us being pillars. It's going to take you upholding it and saying, you know what? I'm going to buy into what God is doing here. You never know, friends. Your money, what you give. What you give can send out a missionary that can, that can just start some kind of revival in some remote place in the world. You never know how far your money could go. You never know. And this is the honor, the honor and the dignity of being a pillar. That you can make impact in the world and live in your local city, serve God in your local church. Just be an example, love God, love people and be a giver. That you can make great impact that Satan can fear you're given. The devil knows it costs money to reach the world. And when you're blessed financially, when you're a giver and you have an open heart and you have the spirit that they had in this text, the devil is very, very much threatened by your life. Because he knows your giving is going to open doors. Your give, imagine if North York never had those $24,000. Nemi wouldn't have nowhere to sleep. <laughs> Could you imagine? And they would support us. The next year they supported us. And it was probably a little bit more, just more needs, more demands, more outreach ideas. And when you plant a church, you got to cover that. And when you plant a missionary, you're not just covering church expenses, but you got to cover the missionary's expenses. And you know Christian guys with big families, right? It's like a thing. They like to have minimum three kids. It's weird. So you got to pay for all his hungry belly kids, <laughs> his wife's shopping addiction. You got to pay for him. You got to get them a car. You can't take a couple from Canada, make them lose their job, put them in Singapore, and tell them to get a job to pay for themselves. That job is going to be a distraction when they can spend time reaching, reaching the lost and building the church. So you have to pay for all their expenses. That's easily 100 grand. Easily. Especially if they're a family of five. We have, to, listen, this is what we're going to be doing here in Oshawa, guys. But you got to give. You got to give. You got to say, you know what? I'm going to take my stance. I'm going to uphold finances. And I'm not saying for you to go broke and, you know, sacrificial giving every week. That, that's, that's ridiculous. But, but begin to open your heart. Say, God, I need you to do something in me. I want to be a blessing financially. I want to give to my local church. I understand the needs. I understand we're trying to reach the world. You might not be able to outreach. You might, you, maybe you're dealing with fear and things of that nature. You give. There are times I would pay my tithe and I would give above my tithe and offering. Well, I always give above. But there are times when I would say, God, with this offering, I want, I want to see X, Y, and Z. Reach the world. Let this go far beyond my imagination. And you connect with God, with your finances. Connect with God. Sometimes people don't give because they're so bad with their money. There's so much debt they can't give. And it's a problem. And this is why it's important that Christians are good stewards for their finances. Because the devil will chain you up man you're in handcuffs you can't even reach your pocket I want to tell you that there is honor in being a pillar there is honor in being faithful service after service ministry after ministry opportunity to give after opportunity to give there is an honor there is a great reward for you in heaven we don't have to just look at the Billy Grahams and those who've done great things. Thank God for them. Thank God for their drive. Thank God for all that they've done for the kingdom of God. But I want to tell you, none of you are second-class citizens in the kingdom of God. There's no such thing as a second-class citizen in God's kingdom. That there is an honor. The fact that you're here, that you dress up, God sees that. 
God sees your sacrifice. He sees your consistency. And I want to encourage you. Maybe you don't fit these descriptions. And God spoke to you. There's an altar tonight. And you can tell. I want to challenge you. Say, you know, I'm going to be. I'm going to start being a pillar, man. I'm going to start reading my Bible. What does the church believe about this? What does the church believe about tongues? What does the church believe about healing? Let me talk to one of the elders. Let me talk to the pastor. Let me study my Bible. I'm going to start upholding doctrine. I'm going to start upholding fine. I'm going to give. And you take on that mantle. Because I believe, friends, like there's an explosive revival coming our way. And God, God knows that, listen, the temple is only as big as those who support it. And we just need more supporters, more pillars. Sometimes people are so afraid to surrender all. They think, oh, Pastor Joseph is going to send me to self Sudan. Like, what? <laughs> bro, just, bro, just come to church and read your Bible, pray, and give. That's it, man. I'm not trying to kick you. Go, here, go, missionary. Come on, that's absurd. But just tell yourself, I'm going to take on this mantle. I'm going to be a pillar. I'm going to be a pillar. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. There are fine men and women here, amen. God sees every effort. God sees your sacrifice. God sees your commitment. And I want to tell you there's a reward for you in heaven. He is a rewarder. He is a rewarder. He takes notes of every faithful decision you make. He takes notes and he plans to reward you. The little things, man. Not all of us are going to be mega church pastors or some big time missionary or some big time evangelist. But none of us are second class citizens. And maybe you wrestle with this internally, your worth in the kingdom of God. This is a real temptation for people. People feel less than. People feel inadequate. My ministry is smaller than theirs. They do more ministry than me. They start to compare themselves to other people. I want to tell you, you're not less than. I want to tell you, God sees all your efforts. And there's a reward in heaven. And there is honor for the average everyday Christian, there is honor for you. But then there are people, you might be here. I want to give a call, an opportunity. Maybe you're here, you're not a Christian. You're not living for God. If you were to die today, you have no assurance that heaven will be your home. But tonight you want to repent. You want to accept Jesus into your heart. You want to be made new. You're tired of wrestling sin. You're saying, Pastor, I'm tired. My sin's beating me up covetousness pornography masturbation whatever it might be lying stealing alcohol being a drunkard whatever it might be marijuana whatever it might be lust and you're tired jesus says he who sins is a slave to sin you're a slave but you're tired of being a slave and you want freedom tonight i want to tell you friend there's freedom in jesus and if you're here tonight you want to accept Jesus Christ into your heart. I want you to just do me, do me a solid quickly. Just lift up your hand. If that's you, you want to accept Jesus into your heart, into your life. You want to be made new. You're tired of being a slave to sin. You want freedom and deliverance tonight. Lift your hand quickly all over this place. No one's looking around. This is between you and God. I'm not asking if you go to church. I'm not asking if you believe in Jesus. I'm asking you, if you were to die today, where would you go? And you have no assurance heaven will be your home. But you want, that, you want that security. Lift your hand quickly. Thank God. I want to change the call. Maybe you were once living for God. I see that hand back there. Amen. The Lord bless you. Maybe you were once living for God, but you backslid. You want to rededicate your life. You want to come back home. Surrender your heart to Jesus once again. Lift your hand quickly. I see that hand. The Lord bless you. Thank God. Thank God. Anyone else? God is faithful. God sees you. God knows exactly where you are. God knows exactly where you stand. He knows the posture of your heart. And he cares about you. And he's here for you tonight. He's here for you. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. God bless these faithful ones. 
thank God. God sees it. Anyone else here, you're backslidden. You were once living for God, but you want to rededicate your life. I want to speak to the Christian here that feels less than. I want to tell you there's glory and honor in being a pillar. I want to tell you all over our fellowship, what makes our fellowship is not the leaders. It's not just Greg Mitchell who's traveling the world and thank God for Pastor Greg Mitchell doing great things. You and I can't even dream how busy his schedule is. It's not the fellowship leaders. It's not just the pastors and the local church. What makes our fellowship what it is, is you, friends. It is the fine young men and women who will work their jobs, pay their tithes, that they would love people, that they will follow up, that they would be an example. That is what makes our fellowship. It is fine young men, old men, young women, old women. It is fine people like yourselves. And maybe you question that sometimes. You deal with inadequacy. Maybe you're here and you, you're not a pillar. You're not upholding anything. You got to buy in. And you're saying, God, you know God is calling you to be a pillar. To be more involved than you already are. These altars are open. Let's stand, church, as we sing. You come to the altar, amen, tonight. Jesus, we love you, we worship you, we thank you, my God. Oh, God, we thank you. You pray and you speak to God. God, I want to be a pillar. I want to be a member. I want to uphold. I want to help build. I want to sustain. Help me, God. Help me to uphold culture. God, I need you. I want to be an example to other people around me. Oh, God, help your people. God, help your people. 